It's a very great honor for me to be here, not only to kick this meeting off, but congratulations to ABMAT. I thought maybe two, three tables are full, and then we are basically among ourselves, but after such a long day, the, the room is full. Uh, I think that, that the topic, and for that matter, you guys, this whole speaks for themselves, and for me it's a great honor, because when we started seeing this device, uh, Impella, was about 40 minutes away from our hospital, and four years ago we, we saw the very, very first baby, if I may say, and we used it, and um, we thought uh, we should uh, implement some, some improvements on the device and then see this now maturing and now hitting the United States. Uh, that it's wonderful to see, and it's, it's a great honor for me to, to start talking about the um, future perspective of circulatory support in acute heart failure with the rationale for a continuum of care. To give you an outline of my talk, um, the circulatory support for whom, and then some historical perspectives, and then our need as a clinician. Obviously, the goal of circulatory support is to stabilize the hemodynamics. If we look on the left, blood pressure, and uh, on the lower part, blood flow. Then you can see the, ter the therapeutic goal actually is uh, to keep the patient normotensive and normodynamic. That's really the goal when we um, tackle uh, heart failure. And if we go to heart failure, it's also very essential that if we differentiate between acute heart failure and chronic heart failure. In many ways, this is a big difference. And you can see here, acute heart failure, that's a sudden onset of organ failure, uh, whereas chronic heart failure, the gradual onset of organ failure. Cardiogenic shock with more than 50% mortality in acute heart failure, whereas in chronic heart failure, that's graded in severity as we all know. And we need for acute heart failure emergency circulatory support, whereas in chronic, <clears throat> there's a scheduled circulatory support. Better end organ status, early support favors outcome dependent uh, on chronic heart failure. You see, in acute heart failure, the heart is more likely to recover as opposed to chronic heart failure. This is essentially the message between the two that we have to address. And if we tailor the circulatory support based on what I said before, if we look at the acute syndromes, which are unresponsive to drugs and intraortic balloon counterpulsation um, and chronic syndromes, then we initiate the circulatory support, but then the heart, as a first option, could recover. And you can see then downline, downstream both go uh, the same way. But if we look at the acute heart failure and we interact fairly early on, there's a good chance that the myocardium might recover and we never reach that part on the lower end. If we look at the continuum of, the, of care strategy, which will help tailor the uh, therapy according to the patient needs, then we look at the pre-shock, and of course, if we look at days, weeks, and months, you can see there's a step up if we look at the devices. And we always start with pre-shock with intraortic counterpulsation, in shock, we use percutaneous uh, ventricular assist devices, and then in profound shock, then we go to surgical VADs. The historical perspective, really, uh, if we start out very early on, it all started with ECMO. In the 70s, remember, intraortic balloon uh, counterpulsation was used widely and still is today. And then uh, beginning late 70s, early 80s, CPS, followed by the hemo pump, the tandem heart, and now Impella is on the screen and being used in, uh, in this setting. If we look at intraortic balloon counterpulsation, there's no doubt that this is a very, very effective, well-sustained and, uh, and well-used and well-known uh, support uh, measure. The pros for intraortic balloon counterpulsation, it is definitely a mature uh, technology. It increases, however, only modestly cardiac output. We shouldn't forget that. It increases coronary perfusion by diastolic augmentation. And certainly one of the major is the ease of use. It's very easy to and very quickly, can be done very quickly, and it's very easy to be used. And there's a low complication rate over time. The technology simply matured and improved. The cons, it really does not unload the heart. If we look at the physiology, intraortic balloon counterpulsation uh, really does not unload the heart very effectively. Uh, it does require a minimum uh, of cardiac function, 
sometimes people forget, but it's very important and important to mention here, it does require a stable rhythm. And uh, <clears throat> there is, and it's also very important and very interesting if we look at regulatory processes today, there's no proven benefit on mortality. This is the PAMI-2 trial that um, has been published by Greg Stone in uh, 1997 uh, uh, with high-risk patients randomized to 26 to 48 hours intraortic balloon counterpartation to, to conventional therapy after PCI. And you can see here overall across the board there's no benefit in mortality or left ventricular function at discharge and six weeks. We just have to, have to note that. Even though people use intraortic counterpartation, but there's, as I said before, no proven benefit on mortality. The percutaneous VAD, the tandem heart, it's also a very interesting device that removes oxygenated blood from the left atrium by a transeptal cannula inserted into the femoral vein. A centrifugal external pump aspirates the blood outside the body and returns the blood via the femoral artery or arteries, which indirectly then unloads the left ventricle. And it does provide continuous flow to the systemic circulation. If we look at the um, publication here, 2005, and we look in red intraortic balloon counterpulsation, and then the percutaneous VAD in yellow. You can see if we look at cardiac index, this is definitely superior to intraortic counterpulsation. All the bars on the left side, cardiac index, is better, increases with VAD uh, over uh, intraortic counterpulsation. Venous pressure consequently lowers um, pre and post. And if we look at the wedge pressure as part an indicator for left ventricular and diastolic pressure function, it goes down after uh, VAD, serum lactate, uh, is posed then also differently. So there's no doubt that percutaneous VAD is in many ways hemodynamically superior to intraortic counterpulsation. The Archimedes screw, the hemo pump, the advantage is unloaded and decompressed left ventricle, reduces oxygen demand independent from heart function, maintains a, a 50 millimeter mercury MAP during cardiac arrest and decreases pulmonary wedge pressure. The disadvantage is it's a very real, uh, the re reliability of the system, uh, the stiffness of the catheter is being used, and the pump stability, and of course there's 21 French in this cir in, under these circumstances, limb ischemia. And now the impeller device, the 2.5, you can see here the animation. It's a miniaturized technology with a 12 French uh, pump. It can be placed over the wire. Uh, it, it inserted across the aortic valve, as you can see here. There's a pigtail for increased pump stability, and the catheter 9 French for better limb perfusion. And the flow modulation is 2.5, maintains 2.5 liters per minute, as you can see here. So it can be used very elegantly percutaneously, fairly rapidly, insertion can be done uh, fairly quickly and it uses standard approaches as we used in interventional techniques. It aspirates the blood in the left ventricle and uh, then expels the blood in the, uh, in the aortic arch or in the uh, descending aorta, thus increasing perfusion and increasing cardiac output. So this is all uh, the thinking that's behind the Impeller 2.5. The worldwide impeller experience in the United States and outside the United States and outside the United States, it is a commercial product. You can see over 1,000 reported patients being used, over 90 institutions in more than 40 countries, and over 40 peer-reviewed publications. If we look at the use uh, on the right side, you can see the impeller 2.5 in 95% this device being used by interventional cardiologists and in 3% by the surgeons. I think given the size and the 2.5, it's a very natural thing. The surgeons just treat the sicker patients and they simply have better access to the, to the vessels. And consequently, if we look at cardiac surgery, the Impeller RD, you can see here Impeller 5.0 is uh, widely used and more used by the surgeons. Uh, no, less used, I'm sorry, less used by the surgeons. You can see here 57% um, and the Impeller RD in 15%, the 5.0 in 23% and only in 5% the Impeller 2.5. So maximum support by the surgeons 
is needed uh, and it's used in the 5.0 and uh, impeller RD. The unloading activity of the left ventricle reduces the workload and increases cardiac output as shown here, uh, which is the pump off and on, the pump off in red and the pump on in green. You can see the end diastolic left ventricular pressure lowers. Uh, the end diastolic stroke volume uh, also lowers when the pump is on and the total cardiac output increases as the function of unloading the left ventricle. Here you can see basically the same thing. It does reduce the workload and increases cardiac output. You can see here pre-pump and with pump. Uh, this is statistically significant. If we look at the cardiac output, pre-pump 4.0, with pump 5.7, mean arterial pressure 57, 74, left atrial pressure reduced to 25 to 16, and lactate is being lowered 3.8 to 1.5, and as I said, this is statistically significant. So if we look at the literature, uh, it can be demonstrated that the use is extensive and uh, it is a, basically a very safe device once you implant it into the left ventricle. You can see aortic regurgitation, uh, and if you look, uh, there's absolutely no sign of AI when the pump is in place. We have seen this ourselves, and you can see it's being demonstrated in the literature. And then echo findings with traumatic or trauma to the valves, to the aortic valve, or the left ventricle also, no in all publications. So in essence, if we introduce that device, uh, then we would not expect any trauma to the valve leaflets or any hemodynamic uh, impairment due to aortic regurgitation. If we look then at the comparison of the support devices, uh, compare intraortic balloon counterpulsation, CPS, the tandem heart, and the impeller at the far right. We look at the catheter size, 7.529, CPS 2118, tandem heart 2117 15, impeller 9. Cannula size, 8.510, and CPS 2118, tandem heart 2117 15, and impeller 12. The insertion site, in e intraortic balloon counterpulsation and an impeller only one. In CPS, tandem heart, you need two at least. Anticoagulation, you need heavy or very severe, very, very secure anticoagulation, CPS and tandem heart. Uh, intraortic counterpulsation and impeller does need it too. Limb ischemia is not really an issue. We haven't seen it occasionally, but it is obviously more in the larger uh, French sizes no priming volume in uh, IAPB and an impeller. Uh, then if we look at the comparison of those four devices, it unloads directly the left ventricle. In impeller, it certainly does. Intraortic balloon counterpartation, no. CPS, no. And the tandem heart, no. Regular stable rhythm, uh, yes, you need it. In intraortic balloon counterpartation, you don't need it in CPS, tandem heart, and impeller. And the improved hemodynamics, you can see the pluses. Intraortic balloon counterpartation being easy to use and being a long-standing technology obviously is proven. So our need as a clinician, and these are the last slides, if we look uh, down on the lower part, uh, days, weeks, and months, and we look cardiology in perspective to surgery, and uh, look at the left side flow in liters per minute, we would definitely say in pre-shock, starting out with intraortic balloon counterpulsation. Then impeller 2.5 comes into the game, maintaining 2.5 liter per minute, and then in the shock. And when the surgeons come in, then they, they prefer to use uh, impeller 5.0, which is larger size French, and of course, then also expels more, uh, more blood, 5 liters per minute, and then profound shock, BVS pump, and AB 5000. So in summary, for acute heart failure patients that failed conventional therapies, including inotropes and intraortic balloon counterpulsation, we need a comprehensive circulatory support strategy that is easy to use, is effective in restoring patient hemodynamics, and is tailored to the patient's need to help recovery. Thank you very much for your attention.